Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my great pleasure today to introduce a uh, longtime uh, friend and colleague, uh, Professor Leonardo Tondo, uh, who was educated and actually grew up in Rome and was educated at the University of Rome and did his psychiatric training there, worked uh, for some time with a a uh, late colleague of ours, uh, Athanasio uh, Koukopoulos, who was a really very uh, important figure in, in uh, telling us a lot about uh, bipolar disorder and its many manifestations, and developed a, uh, a, a very interesting mood disorder program in Rome uh, named for the real inventor of ECT, uh, Lucio Bini even though uh, his professor, Ugo Cerletti, gets uh, a lot of the credit. Uh, Beanie really did the work that established ECT clinically. And uh, a mood disorder clinic uh, was set up in, in Rome named for uh, Beanie. And uh, Leonardo did some of his training there and then had an opportunity to get a, a university appointment uh, at the University of Cagliari in Sardinia and set up his own uh, Lucio Bini mood disorder clinic. Uh, and we've been working together with the fruits of his labors since the 1970s. And I can tell you that what he's established there is a gold mine of incredibly uh, detailed and now computerized clinical records on thousands of patients with severe mood disorders. And it's enabled, it's supported and enabled uh, years of uh, very productive research collaboration. Uh, today, he's going to be talking on a different topic. He's going to be telling us uh, some things he's done uh, late leading to a book that he published last year on uh, paranoia or delusional uh, disorders. So, Dr. Tondo. Thank you, Ross, for this nice introduction, and thanks for the invitation here and speaking of a subject that is not a, exactly my cup of tea, but I studied and I published a book a year ago, and I think that I, well, I learned a lot about uh, paranoia and delusional disorders. I don't have conflict of interest to disclose. Maybe, you know, someone may think that I have. And I'll start with a question. Would you open the door to a stranger? I mean, I don't know, we, don't, we can't really do a survey here, but I will tell you that no will be the answer of most of the people. And this is because we tend to understand more those who will not open the door than those who do. Those who accept the stranger unconditionally are not among our ancestors, very likely they were killed. Which brings the idea that the general uh, projection attitudes and paranoia is something that is genetically transmitted and has some kind of evolutionary positive meaning. Distrust has been transmitted across generations and it could be again genetical transmission but also modeling through observational behavior kids looking the way parents behave and will probably follow more or less the same uh, uh, behavior. Everything actually starts with the concept of identity. And there is an identity which is physical and also mental, as we know, and is probably written in our DNA. In fact, we defend our physical identity even from cellular levels. I mean, we know our body is organized and planned and programmed in order to be careful and to remove everything foreign that arrives in, so into our body. And also, we tend to help others only if we are certain that they will not become enemies. And again, everything is associated with the survival of the individual, but also with the survival of the species. On the other hand, culture helps us overcome the concept of identity and include the other. So if we are born and we grow in our first years with the idea that the, the foreign people cannot be really accepted into our groups, 
eventually with some culture we tend to improve our relationship with others and we tend to include others more actually more frequently a recent um, exhibit in rome uh, there was this i mean the theme was basically this i is another b the other which is pretty much the idea that if we start considering the other as ourselves, maybe we could uh, fill the gap between us and the others. And also there is another exhibit, right? I mean, going on right now in, um, in Rome, and which I believe is more or less in all Europe, I am the other. And this is because in Europe, and again, here in, also here in the States, we had to deal with a big uh, issue of immigration and that immigration has steered an incredible level of projective feelings and, in a way, uh, subtle or sub-threshold paranoia. The idea of defending ourselves and defending our identity actually starts with this, with a usual saying that it's better worry than sorry. And again, evolutionary defense mechanism developed against strangers not belonging to the same species, uh, tribe or group, and especially for species, that's very, very common in animals. So I mean, we don't really wonder about the fact that some animals do not accept other animals. But it happens in tribe or group, and we know this. Uh, skin color, of course, we know that it could be a problem uh, associated with a defense mechanism belonging to a country compared to another. And so this is very common in Europe. It's really felt right now. And there are very national, very highly national uh, feelings and sentiments. Language is another barrier that can define strangers. And of course, religion, but also a political party and also a sport team. So we know that distrust favors the survival of species propagating, propagating the same uh, attitude, but it comes with a huge problem. This, with distrust, we uh, hinder the mating and relationships. So if people stay in their own homes and don't have, do not have contact with anybody else, probably they're safe, but on the other hand, I mean, their relationship are very, very, I mean, the level is really, really poor. So probably it's not something that we should uh, publicize. Then we have a culture is associated with our the cortical processes. And so cortex help us select people based on gender, education, ethnicity, appearance, age, facial expression. We actually, when we see a person, we actually we operate a, a trust scan and we decide whether that person could be trustworthy or not. However, we are easily cheated by those who know how to introduce themselves, whereas we keep others at a distance. And often we are wrong in both cases. And so we can accept people that eventually are not supposed to be trusted. And we can send away other people who could be easily trusted. An excess of deeply rooted distrust brings to prejudice. And prejudice is and it's sort of a mixture of fear and lack of information and culture. So we don't know a person, we don't know how the person think or reacts or everything, and so we, we, we are afraid, and we are afraid because we don't have enough culture to understand what is going on. Extreme distrust is common in paranoia and schizophrenia. Speaking about trusting other people, was a question, would you trust most other people? And it was a question um, which was the base of a survey by the Pew Center Research in 2014. And they investigated in four group of people the answer to this question. No was the answer in 19% of millennials, 13% of the generation X, 37% of the silent generation, 40% of the baby boomers, showing what? That unlike what we think, which is a pessimistic idea that 
distrust is increasing in the recent years, it's not the case. I mean, because as we probably know, distrust is much more common in older people. And older people tend to be more worried about the others because they are weaker. And so they feel that the others can actually be harmful to them. It's a, it's a good example is, for instance, the fact that older people with some kind of uh, hearing issues tend to be much more paranoid than other people. So any type of weakness is associated with a possible feeling of, let's say, in general, paranoia. On the other hand, and this is, goes back to the idea of culture, young adults from minorities and low social economical level reported less trust than others. Again, cultures is really important. And also, we know that distrust grows with um, age, and we decided, you know, why. There is another point at this point, which is fear, relationship between fear and culture. Fear is emotional, as we know, but sometimes can be rational. I mean, there are fears and uh, that are completely reasonable. Some fears are not reasonable, and probably they're based on our perception. Culture is mainly rational. And fear and culture are often an inversely proportion, uh, proportional relationship. So what we should do is decrease in fear, but it's difficult. And maybe we can increase culture, which is actually much uh, uh, easier. And a, a better culture would decrease the level of fear that we have, especially when we speak about a fear that we have towards others. This idea of prejudice, lack of culture, brings up the subject of emotional beliefs, which are widespread. We have, uh, well, I mean, everybody has his own, her own emotional beliefs. And um, I'm, I have listed some of the most common emotional beliefs in these days. One about the chemical trails, I don't know if you're ex I mean, expert about this, as spread by international organization to make all men become gay. Vaccines are the cause of autism, and you know that it's based on a uh, fake uh, article from 1975 that eventually was rejected, but still that kind of a uh, that kind of uh, 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 emotional belief is still very much rooted. Several celebrities are not believed dead, like Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, for instance, and or believe that they are, like Paul McCartney. And uh, men have never landed on the moon, as we know. And we are surrounded by reptilians, which is a very common uh, emotional belief. Doctor use medicines because paid by big pharma, which sometimes is actually true. And also, we have finally the fake news and the, this big population of haters, which are everywhere. And uh, they're, I mean, they're basically, I mean, spreading with the, I mean, through the social networks. And then, of course, there are others that are not listed here. So all these are basically. Uh, that can be considered conspiracies. And there are some common features of conspiracies. All proofs against the conspiracies actually made it stronger, as in people with paranoia. Conspiracies are more, I mean, um, uh, uh, always dangerous for individuals or the group to which they belong, which is a typical idea of uh, people with paranoia. There is always a persecutory change organized by individuals or institutions. There are no conspiracies for something very good happening to us. There is always something negative. Otherwise, it would not be a conspiracy. Who believes in one conspiracy will believe in others, multiple conspiracy ideas. Conspiracies are fed by negative perception, and they need to have two important feelings, I mean, two important issues. One, that the institution has to be superior to us, and the other one is that we had to be weak. We, we feel that we are inferior to that kind of force. And that is the reason why the USA is hated in many parts of the world. Conspiracies consider only less likely explanations 
and ignore the simplest one. And this is called the Occam razor, and I don't know if you're familiar with this idea. Um, it's also called the law of parsimony. It's a, it's, a, it's a principle of problem solving which says, claims that if I had to find a solution in the same type of condition, I had to look for the simplest, con I mean, the simplest solution rather than the most complicated, which is totally against what the conspirators think. They look for the most complicated idea rather than the uh, most simple. Just to give a note about um, Occam. Occam was a, a friar, Franciscan friar, lived in the th um, 13th century, and he was a philosopher and a theologian. And uh, the idea of, of parsimony has actually been developed and include a lot of explanation in physics and uh, uh, science, and it's still very much uh, used. Everything has been uh, read in, on Wikipedia. Paranoia is also an illness. And uh, with some uh, kind of precise chronology, starting in, uh, in uh, ancient Greece, and it was just called, I mean, just considered mental derangement, nothing more than that. Burton in, uh, 17, 20, in 1621 in The Anatomy of Melancholy includes persecutory ideas in, the, in, the, in his book, but especially in depressive people. Hein wrote, was the first one in 1818, which indicated that the disorder has two sides, one the intellect and, and the other one uh, will and feeling. So the intellect was disturbed. People might have strange ideas, but the will and feeling was actually uh, in good shape. Carl Baum was the one distinguishing between the depressive and the expansive type. We'll, I will show something about that. And Jasper par uh, spoke about the paranoid development, which means that paranoia is not like bipolar disorder uh, starting from one day to another, but I mean, it has a development through many, many years. And of course, there is some kind of premorbid personality. Kreppelin was the one who published a book, uh, I mean, a long essay about paranoia, and he used the term paranoia instead of ferrochyte, which was instead the previous term indicated, again, a mental derangement rather than this specific idea of paranoia, which is the one that we use in our psychiatric lexicon in these days. Schneider was the first one thinking that uh, paranoia was a, an aspect of uh, schizophrenia, especially because it was not a very common uh, illness. And Meyer Gross considered paranoia as a syndrome with systema systematized chronic delusions. If we go through uh, quickly through the classification of the ICD and the DSM, what we see is that paranoia was present in the first um, uh, uh, edition of the DSM-1 and also in the early ICD-8 as paranoia, but in both cases it was considered a rare illness. Through the years, in the last, I don't know, 60, 70 years, uh, paranoia has been englobated in the delusional disorders and with the difference that the delusions of paranoia are not considered bizarre. And that means that the, a bizarre delusion is impossible, but the delusions in paranoia are highly unlikely, but not impossible. Delusion of persecution, delusion of jealousy, or hypochondriasis are not completely impossible, but extremely unlikely. So the point is that all through uh, ancient Greece to the DSM-5, uh, paranoia is now considered part of schizophrenia with some non-bizarre delusions. And uh, two um, major scholars, German scholars, who wrote uh, a beautiful uh, article in uh, Psychiatric Clinics of North America in 1995 ended their uh, essay with this uh, sentence, which I think is really 
interesting and uh, it should say something about the the way we um, make diagnosis and so it says well you know after 20, 200 years you know, we discussed about whether a delusion is bizarre or, or not but indeed paranoia is a rare event it's a rare actually illness and it seems that it the prevalence of paranoia is more or less 0.2% of the population, but the big problem, and this was identified by Krebenim himself, is that the patients do not seek psychiatric help, and so we don't see them. So they're just around, but we don't see them. They don't, want, they don't consider themselves. They have a high level of functioning, unlike schizophrenic, I mean, people with schizophrenia, and so we don't see them, and so probably the percentage, I mean, the prevalence is higher. There is a 3% of paranoid personality, people with paranoid personality. Ideas or reference is present up to 19% of some of the population. Diffidence is even more common. And then we know the persecutory delusion are more prevalent than others. The onset is uh, around age 40. And in fact, in classical psychiatry, paranoia was also described as a, a late onset uh, schizophrenia. 80% of the people are employed, which means that actually their functioning is not really bad, but not with a high status. There are also some uh, differences between paranoia and schizophrenia. On, I mean, later onset, uh, premorbid personality with projection as the main uh, defense mechanism, a systematized delusion, unlike schizophrenia, the social contagion. This is very important in, uh, I mean, in what we are discussing later, which actually brings to the shared idea, I mean, to the shared uh, delusions. Possible local logical uh, comprehension, low prevalence, chronic evolution, and no cognitive decline, which is a good thing and a bad thing, you know, in some other ways. Kreppeling um, published his essay on paranoia. It's, a, it's not a very long essay. It's included in uh, also the bigger book, and it's about 70 pages, and includes actually most of the information on paranoia that is still very, very modern, about the psychological implications, the description of paranoia as, the, as, as it shows, and it it's manifests itself. Um, summarizing what Kreppelin uh, used to say about paranoia, it's a, it says that first of all, it's a primary illness, it's not secondary to other illnesses, unknown origin, presence of possible idea, mostly not corresponding to reality without major interference with logo, logical functioning, which is what we know. Chronic course, no hallucinations. Actually, Kreppelin made a difference between paranoia, which had very rarely hallucinations, and paraphrenia, which was instead, uh, which would include also hallucination. Disturbed background personality uncertainty about prevalence due to the lack of the person's awareness and uh, reporting. There is also another section of the description of Kreppelin which includes the idea of primitive thinking in paranoia, which is quite interesting and should be also, I guess, it would be probably worth reading it. Paranoia uh, presents itself with delusions and delusions following Kalbaum are two types, depressive and expensive. Depressive delusions are those which, are, which would include self-referred insults, depressive moods, self-devaluation, and usually are those with delusion of persecution, jealousy, hypochondriacal, uh, querulous, and, uh, and that's it. And also the other one are the, expen the expensive. And, uh, these are people with uh, elation, uh, excited mood, and uh, we can actually say that they compensate for their perception of failure with delusion of inventions, belonging to an important family, which is a delusion of gen genealogy, mystical delusions or erotomaniac delusions. So what happens in a, a possible paranoid pyramid is that we go from the fear of actual danger down to a motivated suspicion, non-motivated suspicion, presence of non-existent danger, paranoid personality, white psychosis, and delusion. Probably, I don't know whether you heard about 
the concept of white psychosis. They're kind of uh, described in uh, French and Italian literature, I mean, psychiatric literature in these days. And basically, they refer to people who, we, with whom we do not feel at ease in some way. We cannot really share, as they say, the same vision of the world. And in order to describe them, those are people with a high level of originality, eccentricity, weirdness, uh, they might show mannerisms, some strange movements and language inadequate to the moment or the place, fanatism or ego exaltation, hoarding is a common uh, feature. Um, they are disquiet, they don't know where to stay, how to stay in a place, and how to behave. They have compromised relationship or other issues. There is a big, I mean, a long list of so-called white psychosis. I mean, of course, they're not psychosis, but on the other hand, uh, they're not uh, a behavior with, with, with which we would feel that we relate easily. Some, uh, uh, just uh, two notes about the phenomenology of delusions. As I said, there, there are depressive delusions, which are an expensive delusions. And in both polarities, there is a, a sort of a subconscious weakness, and the person cannot accept this type of failure in his life uh, and this type of weakness, and uh, what is called an inferiority complex. People who know deep inside that they have weakness, but they do not, they do not accept them, especially weakness. Sometimes it's a cultural weakness, and that actually is the reason why conspiracies against science is associated with, in, is, is very present in people with an uh, unsophisticated cultural level. They tend to group together and seek someone who can protect their interests. Knowledge is dangerous because it has a power they cannot control. Therefore, their leader should speak with certainties and oppose science. We'll go through this. Everything started with the splitting. Splitting is a concept in evolutionary psychiatry. And uh, it started with the hunter-gatherers who could separate from the group with no problem. And uh, with agriculture, which brought stability, the food scarcity would probably begin the idea that the others would steal our own uh, product, our tools, and everything else. So most of the splitting, splitting resulted in peaceful separation of many fought against those who detained the power. And it seems to see you know, the same type of situations in many areas of the world right now. Very little has changed. And also in these days, things have become even more critical because of overpopulation in the mega uh, cities. The idea of splitting, the idea of a leader, brings up another important idea of charisma. There is a beautiful book published in 1995 about charisma, and he gets things together with charisma plus um, paranoid feelings. And uh, charisma is a, a step that brings from uh, being a, a leader of a group of people up to levels that are very, very close to delusions. Charisma, according to a, a, a ancient Greeks, was a, a gift if used properly, but a possible danger if it moves large crowds. Not all charismatic leaders, of course, have dangerous, uh, are dangerous or can actually have make disasters, but some are. Two-way relationship, there is a relationship between a leader which usually has uh, paranoid features, and a crowd, which is uh, a crowd of followers who can be described as with the idea of being or trying to identify with the leader and at the same time trying to compensate for their own weakness. And they think that they could be protected by the same leaders. Both sides are in common ignorance and desire to rule against the power considered oppressive. And uh, we were discussing today with Ross when I mean, thinking about the Second Amendment and the idea of keeping arms because we want to keep arms to fight against possible enemies 
arrive into our house or maybe place. Both sides need each other, and uh, the relationship between uh, knowledge and charisma is that some people with little knowledge do not trust charismatic leaders because they know that they don't know. So they have enough culture to know and to admit their ignorance. And so those are not the weak people. Those are actually the strong people. Okay, yes. Maybe culture, you mean? Education. Education. Yes. Because yeah. I that's true. The American, uh, yeah, yeah. The, that's, th culture, thanks for this. So anytime you say it's culture, yeah, it's, sometimes it's culture, but sometimes it's education. education. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's Thanks for this. So other people with little knowledge use the shortcut to trust charismatic leaders, and they do not know that they don't know. So these people are people who can actually, in a way, uh, support charismatic leaders, sometimes up to I mean, consequences that could be extremely disastrous. And for instance, this is a, a famous sentence uh, repeatedly uh, said by Hitler, you will be nothing without me and I will be nothing without you. And in this way, inflaming, I mean, all the crowd, I mean, uh, around him. So there is no question that uh, Hitler had uh, persecutory delusions. Uh, they're extremely well uh, recorded. But at the same time, the major disaster in the recent uh, history was probably induced by the combination of these two people, I mean, Hitler and Stalin at the same time. And, uh, and they probably developed the, 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 the major disaster probably because they were in this, uh, uh, they had, I mean, these persecutory feelings. So this is a persecution. We don't talk about right? No, we don't talk, absolutely not. And um, uh, these are the most famous persecutory delusions. I mean, the most famous, I mean, most famous actually more frequent. But of course, we have delusions of jealousy and the famous Othello syndrome. And uh, speaking of this, I ran into a, a very nice sentence that I would like to share with you. Jealousy was born before intelligence, which does not know jealousy and cannot tell much about to console. So, and again, it's a, I mean, the sentence is by Marcel Proust. But what is quite interesting here is that the split between emotional and rational. So intelligence is rational, jealousy is emotional, that there is very much that you can do. And that's the same problem that we have with our paranoid patients, because we try to be rational with but we are speaking a different language because, I mean, actually they speak an emotional language. It is very difficult to reach them. Um, for an example of hypochondriacal de delusion, I, I would like to present how I use that you probably know, of course. And, you know, he was one of the most successful men in uh, American history. But he was so afraid of contamination that he eventually could not eat. Died of starvation, kidney failure, after taking too many medicines and not trusting anybody. That is, I mean, he weighed 90 pounds uh, when he died. And he died on a plane, trying to come back from Mexico to the States to find some kind of treatment. Querulous delusion, there are no special examples, but querulous delusion, I mean, those are delusions of people they're very, very common in police station because those are people against their uh, other people in the same building or maybe in the same office or in many other, maybe, I mean, we have already met people with querulous, I mean, querulomaniacs who will go to a lawyer and say that something is against them. I mean, all the mobbing idea is probably, I mean, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's instead of uh, uh, some kind of querulous um, ideation. Famous are also the delusion of inventions. And um, uh, two cases, one is Semmelweis. This is another interesting concept in uh, paranoia. Semmelweis actually made a huge discovery, saving, I mean, hundreds of lives, probably thousands of lives, because he discovered the 
puerperal fever, and uh, he discovered that it could be easily prevented by hand washing. I mean, the story is a little long, but as it happens with uh, people with paranoia, they, have, they might have a very good idea, bring up the, the idea for a long time, but when they found a major confirmation to their idea, they decompensate. And in fact, I mean, Semmelweis at some point started sending letters of, with uh, strong accusations towards many, many hospitals around the world and, uh, and uh, he really, I mean, he developed this, I mean, he decompensated into a major persecutory delusion and eventually spent the last, I don't know how many years in a, in a, in a psychiatric hospital. A rather similar uh, situation is uh, for Wilhelm Reich. And I mean, the story, the biography of Wilhelm Reich is very, very interesting. And uh, uh, you know that he actually was the founder of major uh, psychotherapeutic intervention, uh, which is still practiced, probably not ac according to his um, initial ideas. And so he invented everything was associated with the uh, orgasmic potency. He invented these machines, organs, which would give uh, potency or energy to people, uh, even not associated with sexual function, but also just with energy as a, uh, I mean, as is, might be needed in people with depression. And he died in prison, and his theory were, I mean, I, I mean, this is a common, his theory was so bizarre that he still had followers, and um, it's, I mean, without any particular criticism. Delusional gene genealogy is, these are two women, and uh, they, the, the woman on the left is Anna Anderson, uh, who was a Polish woman who believed to be the Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanov. And probably you saw the movie, it was, I mean, at some point, she died actually 30 years ago. She married a man here in the States and um, in a sort of relationship which was a little bit like a folie a deux, uh, because even the, the, the husband was convinced that she was the Grand Duchess. And this was based on the fact that the remains of the Grand Duchess were not found in the same, uh, in the same uh, location at Katerinburg, where the entire family was, the entire family, the, I mean, the family of the Tsar was um, uh, killed. And, uh, and the, 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 the remains were found many years later in uh, somewhere in the Urals. But anyway, certainly she was not, she thought that she could be, but she was not the um, Duchess. Uh, another example of uh, delusion is the erotomaniac delusion, which is a fixation with some kind of celebrities and uh, the idea that a celebrity could be in love with us or maybe that we are in love with a celebrity. And uh, a, a, a very in interesting example is uh, John Hinckley. And um, I think that it's important to know something about him because what he said and what he did, he did it because he wanted to offer the great love offering to uh, Jodie Foster, right? He tried to, uh, well, it was, I mean, after 35 years, after trying to kill President Reagan in 1981, he was discharged. And actually, he did not kill anybody. But uh, he stayed 35 years in prison because even in the last years, he was still writing letters to Jody Foster. So, I mean, his delusions has, in, has not disappeared. Now he has to follow certain rules. I mean, he cannot leave, uh, he cannot go 30 miles away from his place, living with his mother, and also, well, lots of constraints. He was inspired by Taxi Driver, by the movie, where basically it was the same story. I mean, this guy wanted to try to kill, to assassinate Governor Wallace and he wanted to impress Jodie Foster. What is paradoxical is that Jodie Foster is openly homosexual, and so it certainly could not be the uh, possible love object of Hinckley. 
But this is interesting because in this type of delusion, what is actually the interpretation is that there is the attraction for impossible persons. So in a way, the person, the person with this type of delusion doesn't really want a relationship with this person because, I mean, otherwise we'll probably look for a possible person. The impossibility of the, of the uh, uh, um, relationship is the, the, the core of this type of delusion. Also interesting that uh, Hinckley was given the diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoid, or borderline personality disorder, since paranoia cannot be, was not considered an illness. Also mystical delusions, and this is Father Divine. Uh, long story, to make a long story short, I mean, he was first a messenger of God, then God himself was the chief of the peace mission in his community. Freedom is the worst sin, but not sexual abuse, and rules are very, very strict. Claimed to have inspired the hydrogen bomb, he was his own claim, and uh, sentences against him increased his fame. Also because during one sentence, the judge died of heart attack. and. Uh, and uh, he received a lot of publicity, and he, I mean, so the, the public thought that he had done something in order to have that, I mean, to make the, die, I mean, had make the judge die of, um, uh, car, I mean, heart failure. Another one is Jim Jones, and I guess that everybody knows the story of Jim Jones. He was a preacher since childhood, founder of the People's Temple, believed in a nuclear apocalypse, became very famous for his social activities, be befriended with many important politicians. He was actually probably the one who supported the um, uh, political campaign on Mosconi, the mayor in uh, San Francisco. And then uh, when he felt, I mean, I, I mean, lots of things were going on in, in, in this huge community, like again, sexual abuse and lots of uh, illegal actions. And then he moved to Guyana, and uh, there he died along with 900 people um, who were poisoned with uh, cyanide. And he, he died, I mean, committed suicide. So this brings, the, brings up the subject of the sects, uh, which require a leader with some mystical ideation and, of course, followers. Followers are, are in search of protection or try to identify with the leader. Their religiosity at times is close to God or at times is close to Satan. Satan. At times when leaders reach their purpose, it's likely they slide into the illusion of being God or Satan. Sex is often a way of connecting leaders with followers, and many, many examples of that. Often they predict the end of the world, and these particular sects are called millenarisms, millenarists. And there is an estimated number of sex in the United States between anything between 150 and 2,000. So very common. There is also a curious paranoia, which is a megalomaniac paranoia in Ludwig II of Bavaria. Um, he was a king at the age of 19. Uh, rejected all official obligations. He was a major support of arts, especially supported the career of Wagner. The only interests were music and uh, art. His paranoia was known, and he was under current, I mean, under constant observation and care of uh, a famous Viennese psychiatrist, Dr. Gaup. The government wanted to depose him because of the crazy expenses in building and castles and uh, supporting art, as well as for <coughs> having sex with men. The paradox is that within two years after his death, his castles became uh, tourist attractions and contributed considerably to the state uh, income. It's still under discussion whether he was he committed suicide or he was suicided, basically uh, killed, believing that he was that he had committed suicide. Last words about Freud and paranoia, and. Uh, if we speak about Freud and paranoia, we should speak about, just uh, summarize the life of Judge Daniel Schreber, who, is, who was a uh, judge in Germany, 
with a strange father who was an orthopedist who liked to try his devices on his son. And uh, his brother killed himself when uh, Daniel was 35. And the following year, Daniel married with no children. Daniel suffered, suffered depressive breakdowns in association with duty responsibilities. Another interesting point, a major life event in the life of a person with some uh, paranoia or paranoid feelings can actually decompensate into a psychosis. His first psychotic episode was after the nomination as president of the Senate of the Dresden Court. In and out of asylums until his death, last admission was after his mother's death. He wrote The Memories of My Nervous Illness, which is a huge book of about 500 pages. Freud never met uh, Schreber and based his interpretation on the judge's book. Freud, I say, became the foundation of the psychoanalytical theory on paranoia based on repressed homosexual desires, and he interpreted uh, Schreber's life and Schreber's delusions as projection of his own feelings towards his doctor, Dr. Paul Flexig, as a projection of his father, I mean, of his brother that of course was dead at the time, and toward God as his father, which, who also was died at the time. Schreber believed that the doctor persecuted him and wanted to make him become a woman. But of course, I mean, according to Freud, the idea was that he wanted to become a woman in some way, and he had to project that on the doctors. The thoughts reflect his alleged homosexuality expression of weakness in front of the psychiatrist as he had been in front of his father. And so the famous phases of the persecutory process, according to Freud, was that I love another man, this can now accept it by my ego, and so I hate him, but this is in contrast with the fact that I love him. In the resolution of the conflict, he hates me, and I hate me because he's persecuting me. It's interesting. Um, we don't really know whether it can be applied to uh, even in uh, psychoanalysis. What's actually also interesting is that Schreiber probably did not have a real paranoia, but it's likely that he had a bipolar disorder with psychotic features because he had periods, long periods of depression and uh, without psychosis. So maybe the major theory about paranoia as an expression of repressed homosexuality is based on uh, a case of bipolar disorder. Freud had spoken of projection even before meeting the essay by Schreber. And uh, projection is important because it's a defense, it's a primitive defense mechanism. It's not my fault, it's the fault of somebody else. It's the fault of professor, it's the fault of the doctor if, I, if, something is, I mean, if something is not correct, I mean, if I make a mistake. So it's a primitive defense mechanism. I try to attribute responsibility to others rather than assuming my own responsibilities. Paranoia represents the pathological evolutionary projection, or projection, and paradoxically is that it is better to accept, to accept the persecutory suffering than our own weaknesses. The stronger this mechanism, the more likely the presence of aggressive components. So projection, if I have a strong projection against another person, I could become aggressive because I feel that I'm persecuted by this person. More recently, and more convincingly, I have to say, that it was a, a beautiful series of studies uh, studied in uh, 1955 on pseudo-homosexuality, which is not indicative of uh, homosexuality at all. It's just uh, indicative of a state of weakness. The idea of being homosexual is associated with being weak. The relationship is probably determined by, at that time, seven years ago, by some kind of defined gender roles, uh, specific cultural constraint imposed by different societies. And a weakness is being anthropologically associated with feminine attributes. And so this model of pseudo-homosexuality and weakness 
has to be, I mean, is confirmed, I mean, could be present in men, but not necessarily in women. So it works with men with feminine attributes, but not with, uh, uh, in women. We don't have a, we don't really have a, uh, a good model for uh, paranoia, psychoanalytical paranoia in uh, women. The interpretation of male homosexuality as a passive trait in present, is present in feminine homicides. An abandoned man, offended in his manhood, reacts aggressively hurting and killing a woman. Something quite similar happened in this famous massacre in uh, 2016. A guy, 29-year-old man, enters a gay bar in Orlando and kills 49 people. His father claimed that he had been destroyed by the view of two men killing each other on the street. And? Kissing. Kissing. And instead of interpreting the killing as an extreme interpretation of his religion, we need to consider that the murderer denied or did not accept his homosexual uh, feelings. So he killed other gay people as a way to exercise his own homosexuality following a projective mechanism. So you think that there is a monster inside you and you want to get rid of it, you displace it in others and you kill them. So this is a typical uh, uh, mechanism, projective mechanism, which could explain a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the mass murders in uh, everywhere, but I mean, prevalently in the, in the States. So the, what happens is that the persecutee, the persecuted person becomes the persecutor. So I want to react to my persecution. The reason, I mean, we know that when, uh, when there are massacres like this, when there are mass uh, murderers like this here in the, in, the, in, the, in the States, but also many other places in the world, but apparently in the States are much more frequent, uh, we need to consider that they will receive uh, a mediatic, uh, immediate publicity. And according to the famous journalistic ex expression, if it bleeds, it leads. But then if we look at data, in 2017 in the US, out of 346 shooting reported, 188 caused at least one death. They're actually reported as mass murders, but there was, there was only one death. Indeed, well, actually, there wasn't one death because there were actually several wounded. So it was actually the idea of mass shooter, mass shooting is correct. In the 24 mass murders, according to the FBI definition, which means that you must have at least four deaths, 191 persons were killed including the famous, I mean, sadly famous shooting in Las Vegas where uh, 59 people were uh, killed. But that is only 2.7% of all 7,000 homicides with shotguns in the same year. So we receive information about mass murderers, but it's a very uncommon phenomenon and uh, which becomes very common because of the uh, uh, interest by the press and media. Um, what is important, and it's, it's, it has been calculated that at least anything between 10% and 50% of these shootings are associated with some psychosis, which could be easily uh, attributable to paranoia. The homicides, the persecutors believe themselves to be victims of violence. This is, has been uh, found in gun violence archive. Um, going to the end of my presentation, uh, given all this, I mean, it's a I mean, paranoia, it's a psychotic illness, but the only problem, the huge problem, is that basically there are no treatments. Yes, we could try uh, neuroleptics, uh, sedatives of many different kinds, but usually in paranoia they do not work. In addition to the fact that these people do not accept any treatment. They don't think that they need any kind of treatment. And there is an interesting group of people in England uh, who are very much into 
cognitive therapy of paranoia. And um, you know, very interesting. They, they have published a lot, I mean, books and, uh, and uh, articles. They call Freeman and Freeman. I don't know whether they are related in some way. And, uh, and they have good advice for paranoid persons. So try to uh, develop a, some type of cognitive psychotherapy based on becoming a detached observer or your paranoia, even speaking of it or keeping a journal. So keeping the paranoia more, I mean, in open air rather than inside. Try to understand the reasons for your paranoia. The more you understand what is going on in your head, the less powerful you fear will be. So you decrease, I mean, knowledge would help explaining, I mean, uh, controlling paranoia. Do not accept suspicious thoughts. Talk to them. Weigh the evidence in favor or contrary, looking for alternative explanations, which probably would need the application of the Occam razors. I mean, the idea of the law of parsimony, the most simple explanation is probably the more realistic. And then the, everything is based on this uh, important uh, um, point, which is that everything should be submitted, should be passed as sort of a reality check. And that is probably true in psychiatry for paranoia, for uh, personality disorders, but also for uh, OCD or other type of, um, other type of um, um, psychiatric illnesses. The problem is that most of these people will not go through a reality check. I mean, they, they would not, I mean, certainly uh, when, if they are in a full-blown delusion, they will not certainly be uh, uh, convinced to go through a reality check. And uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, it is a very complicated um, treatment for, uh, for these people. I'm uh, reaching my conclusions. So paranoia is a, a disease, I always been known. It's probably because it's in our genes and it's, everybody has different extent of uh, projection and uh, uh, paranoid uh, feelings. Its classical description requires the presence of systematized delusion with intact cognitive functions. Paranoia does not exist in modern official classification. This is a, uh, 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 I would say something later. So people with disorder do not seek for or accept help. As a defense mechanism, projection is at the base of paranoia. Subtle manifestation of paranoia everywhere, most of them, um, um, most of the time harmless, but really, I mean, rarely very dangerous. Psychoanalytical interpretation see paranoia as an expression of repressed homosexuality in men. Some cognitive strategies may help decrease the intensity of paranoid thoughts. The problem is, the, 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 the problem is that the, for classification, the idea that we don't have paranoia in our own classification has been considered a major issue because in this way it's almost impossible to promote uh, real investigation and research on uh, this subject because there is no question that the delusional disorders are not exactly like paranoia. It's a, it's a, it's a different type of, uh, it's a, it's, it could include, but I mean it's a different type of uh, uh, disease. So it's a, it should be, in a way, I guess that it should be revived in some way. Well, thank you. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I have a comment and a question, if it's okay. Uh, uh, I think the, some of these patients with paranoid delusions end up in forensic settings, and, they're, and the old chestnut that uh, people with uh, paranoid delusions, pure paranoid delusions, are untreatable with antipsychotics has really been overturned in the newer forensic literature uh, from a lot of the forensic hospitals. Uh, they respond, they respond gradually, uh, about half of them respond, uh, no different than lots of other psychotic uh, symptoms. Um, the question I have is, uh, what do you think of the idea about the extreme misogyny 
uh, among certain religious groups, uh, particularly the Wahhabists. And what's your, what's your understanding of that? What, how does a whole, how do, how do women get stoned and killed for holding hands or glancing or showing a little bit of uh, hair or putting on some lipstick? How, where they're really, and, and, how to, and how do brothers kill their, their, their sisters for holding hands or a furtive kiss that the brother finds so uh, threatening? I don't think that I would like to discuss anything associated with uh, um, religious beliefs. Uh, I don't think it's, in a way, I mean, it could be, everything could be said or maybe not. But uh, again, you, we were discussing before, it's, uh, it's something that is shared by so many people in the same place that it cannot be considered paranoia as we cannot consider delusions, a lot of religious beliefs in many ways. But then some type of misogyny, according to the idea of paranoia as an expression of inferiority, could be associated with that, could be associated with the idea that a woman could be perceived uh, as a, a, stronger, uh, a stronger person. And, uh, and sh actually a woman can be stronger because a woman can give life and a man cannot do that. I don't know, I don't know, I mean, there could be different type of projection towards a woman. But certainly, a phenomenon that is quite common, I mean, it's common everywhere, but we, it's being discussed a lot in Europe in the last few years has been the homicides of women, which is associated with this, certainly with some kind of persecutory, paranoid ideas of a man who feels that cannot be abandoned by a woman. And in a way, a woman would uh, indicate his uh, condition of inferiority. And so she needs to be killed because she, she dared to do something that was not supposed to do. So that it's, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, I, I think that there could be a lot of persecutory ideas in what you're saying, in misogyny, yes. Uh, Leonardo, I have the impression that throughout at least the last hundred years of our history that psychiatry has had a very complicated relationship with paranoia. I think Kreplin struggled with it. Where, where did it fit in? How does it separate from dementia, precox, blah, blah, blah. Um, one, one of the things that I'm struck by and, and it came up in some of the discussion today is how many aspects of paranoia are very close to everyday experience in our politics, in religion, in many phenomena that we see all the time. I wonder whether that makes for difficulty in categorizing and psychiatrizing and so on. But I guess what I'm getting at is, do you have some practical ideas about what DSM and ICD should be doing? I mean, do we need a separate category? Do we need a broader category than delusional disorder? Where, where should this go? Because it's, it's way understudied. It's a very common problem. We don't have great treatments for it. It's a problem. So where do we go forward? It is a problem. And, and, and the boundaries between uh, what could be considered, uh, can you say, regular, normal, uh, acceptable, uh, shareable, whatever it is, and the moment when you go through, when you actually you slide into delusion, it's very, very complicated. And also there are lots of people with some type of paranoid feelings who at the same time have a perfect life. I mean, without any, I mean, without causing any problems. So it, most of the times people with paranoia are brought to our attention by their spouses. Be, because, uh, and sometimes there is actually some uh, interesting uh, meaning of the same delusion. Uh, I remember the case of a woman who was, who had delusions that his, that her uh, husband wanted to kill her. 
but for 10 years. I mean, say, well, you know, if, if he wanted to kill you, in, I mean, could have killed 10 years ago, not waiting for 10 years. But eventually she used that as a way to separate from, from, the, from, the, from the husband. In a way, it's, you know, one of those ideas that your psychosis is needed for a purpose. I mean, at least she could, uh, she could uh, uh, separate because she thought that the husband was persecuting her. But another woman had, for instance, the, the idea of having a, a presence in her bedroom every night. And after maybe two years that we were discussing, she said, well, do you see what I'm obliged to invent to have some kind of company? So it's, um, it makes you think that it's not really only uh, biological or um, I mean, of course, it's biological, but it, it could be depend on something more psychological. Dr. Tundo, thank you for a really fantastic talk. I, I, could you comment on Thousand Oaks, like the Thousand Oaks shooting, where it was a veteran, a Marine ve veteran from v uh, Afghanistan, went in and th shot the people in this cafe. You've, uh, is there something that you can tell us about that, analogous to your explanation Which for Orlando? Which shooting is this? Which shooting? It was in Los Angeles, California, in, in Thousand Oaks. There was, it's, a, it's a college town in, in, in the L.A. suburbs. And this young man who was 25 or 6, who no one ever thought had any kind of mental health history, no police record, no nothing, had all this, he had amassed this number of guns and went in with these automatic rifles and shot up a, his community, basically his normal life community. Uh, that to me is a tremendous sign of, a warning sign about the danger of PTSD exploding in some of these violent things. and. How do you how do you explain that? I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't remember the case, and um, it would be nice to maybe to look at the case. In the, I mean, uh, more deeply. Um, but PTSD is could be one of those uh, situations that could um, bring to some kind of a psychosis, because I mean, life events could um, trigger some. Uh, psychotic feelings. But what you're saying is actually brings uh, another important point that most of these people involved in uh, shootings eventually kill themselves. Or if they don't kill, I mean, if they don't kill themselves, they do everything to be killed by, by police. 37% of people involved in mass shootings eventually would die during the shootings. And, uh, and that could be a, some kind of form of a violent uh, uh, suicide, which is not really different from the violent suicide of many people in uh, Kabul or other places where they do this for some kind of reasons. And we cannot really think that people, uh, the, the, the famous, whatever, Islamic violent uh, people who kill themselves and kill I mean, hundreds of other people, they're not in a good shape. It's very, very difficult to convince uh, people to, to, to go and kill themselves and kill other people. I mean, there is a long, I mean, literature about all this. You know, it's, it's a way of killing itself. I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and uh, break. And uh, if people do have questions, then maybe they can approach Dr. Okay. Tondo afterwards. So let's have one final round of applause. Thank you very much.